Okay. Yeah, so maybe it's a uh, small, small size for now. Hopefully, some more people will join. Um, yeah, so I'll welcome everyone to this PhD, PhD, PhD workshop. Uh, I'm Jonathan Scarlett, an assistant professor in computer science and mathematics, and a member of the Institute of, Institute of Data Science uh, organization team. Uh, so just to say a bit about IDS, we're a very interdisciplinary institute, um, sort of combining data science research from researchers in computer science, maths, engineering, and more. And we have several partnerships uh, with agencies and industries in Singapore and beyond. And some of our current projects include the GRAB and NUS AI Lab and the AI and Healthcare Grand Challenge. Um, so we have our PhD program and that's, uh, that's uh, where we have our students that are giving this week's talks. Um, and these workshops are a chance for our students to be able to present what they've learned, um, to get some experience sort of with both learning and teaching. And of course, for the attendees to be able to learn as well and sort of promote interactions uh, between people from various backgrounds. Um, so yeah, with that, I think I can hand things over to Christopher, who's giving today's talk on multiple instance learning. Um, okay, so yeah, go ahead, Christopher. Okay, uh, thanks Prof. Scarlett for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, hi everyone, my name is uh, Christopher and today I'm going to be presenting about uh, this topic called multiple instance learning. Uh, but before that, maybe a bit about myself. Uh, so I'm currently a fourth year PhD student uh, entering fourth year this August uh, at Institute of Data Science NUS. Uh, I did my undergraduate in NUS as well uh, with Faculty of Mathematics. So I was an applied math major. Uh, and currently I'm a member of two labs. So I have Two supervisors for this PhD program. The first one I was uh, I was supervised. I'm supervised by uh, uh, by Associate Professor Alexander Thierry at uh, Department of Statistics and Applied Probability, and my co-supervisor is Jonathan Gokas uh, at Genom at Genom uh, at Genomic Institute of Singapore or GIS. My research area uh, is in uh, is in the application of multiple instance learning mostly to transcriptomics data and biomedical imaging so if any of you are interested to know more about this or want to uh, ask me more questions about my research maybe we can uh, do that uh, afterwards uh, but yeah for now uh, i'm going to first int introduce to you if any of you haven't heard this term multiple instance learning before what is it about so that will be the first part of this presentation I'm just going to be, be spending some time to introduce to you the topics. So if there's anything that is not clear, I hope, uh, feel free to just interrupt me and ask since we don't have a lot of uh, people in this workshop, uh, because this will be important, uh, especially like with some of the terminologies that we'll be using, uh, this, th these will be very important, uh, especially for the later part of the workshop. Uh, but here is some of the out outline. So I'm going to try to do it this way so every time i introduce a new topic we we'll have a lab sessions that will where we will try to implement some of the topics uh, so don't worry about the lab sessions if you don't have anything set up in your computer because we'll be using google collab so as long as you have google account you can just uh, click on the link that i'll provide to you later uh we, via the zoom chat and like you don't have to set up anything you just you can just like run your own code and of course uh it will be on python if you don't know anything about python uh, i'll be guiding you through on how to implement stuff and hopefully you can revise later because the notebook uh, will be accessible even after this workshop then after our first lab we'll be having uh, our lunch break uh, probably i think it's going to be a one hour lunch break because like we need to buy food outside. Uh, then after that, I'll be going through the next topic, followed by lab, uh, another short short break, probably another topic and lab, and then I'll summarize the uh, I'll summarize and conclude the the workshop. Uh, so to begin with, uh, so some of you might not have heard the term multiple instance learning, but uh, you might have heard this term, or you might have known about this, but probably not in this sense, the term single instance learning. So 
The picture that you see on the screen right now is taken from a TV show called Silicon Valley. Uh, I don't know if you've watched it, but in the show, there's this, uh, there's this gag episode basically where one of the characters tried to build a startup around the idea that he can build a classifier uh, basically uh, that can, you know, you give it a picture, then the classifier will tell us if it's a picture of a hot dog or not a hot dog. Well, not much use case for this one since, uh, yeah, you don't really automate, you don't really need to automate the process of uh, detecting whether a picture is a picture of hot dog or not a hot dog. But some takeaways that we can, Ha the, uh, that there are some takeaways from uh, from this uh, simple example. First, what is what are we really doing uh, with this example? What are we really do? What is it that we do when we say we want to classify uh, an image? Uh, it means that we want to learn a model that can predict an outcome associated with a given input. So in this case, the input is a picture, and we implicitly well, not implicitly, but yeah, there's there's this assumption that uh, there is an outcome associated with the picture. In this case, the outcome that we wish to, to predict is whether a given picture is a hot dog or not a hot dog. So meaning every picture out there can be classified as being a hot dog or not a hot dog. And when we say we want to learn a model, we do so by minimizing some discrepancy within the training data and its given labels, if annotated. Meaning, uh, when we want to train this kind of model, we feed it with a lot of images, but not just images. We have already labeled those images so that the model can tell, can learn the association with whether an image is a hot dog or not a hot dog. So this is the training data that we feed and we allow our model to learn the rules behind it. And the goal is, of course, for the model to predict an outcome of an unseen data. So you have your training data, and those are already, already labeled. So you don't really need to know whether your training, uh, whether the pictures in your training data uh, are pictures of hot dogs or not, because they are already labeled. And that is the prerequisite to train a model in this case. Your goal is to predict on an unseen data or test data correctly. So given a new picture, your model should be able should be able to tell whether it's a picture of a hot dog or not a hot dog. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to use some terminology here to connect uh, all of you to this idea of single instance learning. First, when we say we want to train a classifier that can tell whether a picture is a hot dog or not a hot dog, we say that each of this input data is an instance and each instance has an associated outcome. And also in learning, there exists one-to-one -one relationship between input data and its associated outcome. Meaning for every picture or for every instance in our training data, there, 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 exactly, there, there is exactly one one-to-one -one relationship uh, with its outcome. So each picture must be either a hot dog or not a hot dog. And we have all this information uh, in our training data. Every single picture in our training data is labeled with its associated outcome. And there's a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, meaning like if, yeah, meaning like every picture has its associated labels. In fact, like, that's why we call it single instance learning because of the existence of this one-to-one -one relationship. And probably most of the machine learning methods out there that you might have heard of uh, is a form of this single instance learning. When we say we want to do supervised learning, usually we mean classification or regression. So these are some of the examples, as you can see in the slide. Things like image classification is mostly single instance learning like a hot dog or not a hot dog example, for example. When we want to diagnose a patient, there exists like a one-to-one -one relationship, right? Between the patient and the label. So, say we want, say given, uh, given a medical history of a patient, you want, you want to tell whether the person has diabetes or not. There exists a one-to-one -one relationship, right? In this case, a patient and its disease, whether he, he has diabetes or not diabetes. When we do unsupervised learning, when we want to do clustering, for example, we want to, we want to group, uh, we, we have like a database that comprises of customers and their Netflix preference. We want to group the customers who have similar preferences together, for example. We already assume that each of these customer has that kind of 
one-to-one relationship with the things that we want to cluster them to. So in this case, Netflix preferences. Say you love, say we want to separate a group of people who loves the horror movies from a group of people who loves action movies. Suppose they're mutual exclusive, for example. Then like you see that each of the user that you want to cluster here has that one-to-one relationship with the cluster that you want to associate it with. So a person either likes horror movie or or action movies, for example. And in fact, like this is often the case with most of uh, these other learning processes. But say, let us introduce like uh, a new motivating example uh, to, 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 to just probably illustrate what is not a single instance learning. Uh, suppose you're a contact tracer, probably for 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 Singapore. Uh, you have, uh, but the problem is that uh, the COVID patients that you want to trace uh, the locations. Uh, you say you want to trace like some COVID patients, like what what were they do, uh, what did they do in the past fourteen days, and suppose you don't have trace together apps. Uh, suppose they also don't remember much about. Uh, the places they visited in the last 14 days, all they have is a collection of picture with a timestamp. Meaning, you know that within this 20 minutes, uh, this person is likely to stay in one place and you have a collection of pictures from uh, associated with that timestamp. And given those pictures, you want to predict where the person, where did the person go? What was the place that person visited? So the first picture is, this picture, you're supposed to guess where this is from. Not much information, right? This looks like a body of water, can be an ocean, also, or can also be the bathtub. So, somehow the person just takes a picture of a random bathtub in his house, like water from his bathtub in his house, for example. Uh, but yeah, whatever the case is, like not much information you can glean for, from this one picture. You see the next picture associated with the same timestamp, which is a uh, coconut tree then you can probably infer a little bit more right like you won't see coconut tree in the middle of orchard road at least i've i've never seen one so i guess it's safe to assume that this person probably um, visited uh, a beach the problem is it's hard to, to know where it is where, where this beach is like say if we don't limit his location to singapore there can be a lot of beaches right uh in the world and it's hard to pinpoint just based on this but we sort of zoom in the location a bit like we know he's not in the middle of the city for example then the next picture is this so suppose you can recognize that this is a new zealand crab uh, so combined with the previous information probably you can tell that this person visited one of the beaches in new zealand uh, during that time you don't know which one, but at least you narrow down the location even further. Now you see, in this problem, we are given a collection of images. Each of this image, we will call them an instance. And the entire collection of these images is called a back of instances or collection of images. In this case, I'm going to use the term back of instances. So back of instances is just a collection of like various instances that might have some relation to one another. And in this case, that relation is that all of these images, uh, they were taken from the same place. So that's the single label that we can associate with this back of instances. Although we have uh, multiple instances inside, there's only one single label that describes like the entire thing at once. And what we are trying to do here is we want to classify uh, the location, right? We want to predict uh, what, we want to predict what is this place that the person visited during this time, given just this information. Uh, say, what's the nature of a problem? Let's see, each instance here confer some information about the place of origin. So when you're given this back of instances, each instance might have something to say about uh, the label, in this case, the location. Uh, each of them contains some information that you can use independently, or you can perhaps combine them to infer the single label associated uh, 
with this back with this particular back. Also, in this case, we can see that each instance contributes differently uh, to the prediction. For example, this body of water uh, doesn't tell us much. It can be anywhere. It can be your toilet. It can also be the ocean. So not much, but it tells us that this person come from, you know, this, this picture is taken in, in a place that contains a body of water. It's little information, not a lot. The coconut tree allows us to zoom in a bit more. Uh, it tells us that it is in some countries with, with beach. So it's not landlocked country. So this picture of coconut tree probably has higher information content than, than the, this body of ocean. And lastly, the New Zealand crab picture tells us that this is probably from New Zealand, which gives an even higher weightage or it has higher information content as compared to the rest of these images. So in this problem, each instance contributes to some extent to predicting the label of this entire bag, but they contribute differently uh, to the prediction. So what is the learning process here? In this case, we need several steps uh, in order to, to, to be able to solve this problem. First, we need to know what are the labels of each instance, because like deducing the label of each of these instance allows us to gain some information about the places they're taken from. Uh, but other than that, right, like other than just simply classifying what is what kind of pictures are we seeing on the instance level, we are also dealing with this question of how do we extract information, additional information beyond just like the labels that we arbitrarily assign perhaps uh, to each of this instance. For example, this coconut tree. This is not just a picture of a coconut tree, right? Because if we want to infer the location of where this picture is taken from, we can see that uh, we have a timestamp uh, on the phone uh, so we, we, we sort of know like whether it's GMT plus seven, GMT plus eight, for example. And we see that this picture is taken during the day. So we can try to match that. And this will give us additional information, right? The lighting of the picture probably might tell us from, I don't know, the angle of the sun and things like that, that might not. But the point is like, beyond just, this, beyond just the simple labels of these pictures, uh, we can probably extract more information, right? That can be helpful for, helpful for us. And the thing is, we don't know how many of this information can be useful for us in our task of predicting this location. And so the question is, how do we extract all this information? How and how do we best represent them to classify uh, the location? Or in this case, how do we classify this bag of instances uh, labels? And after we have all this, all of this information, there's also a question on how do we aggregate the information from each instance? How do the predicted labels, how do the information extracted from these can be combined together so that we can train a model that can make use of this aggregated representation to do the task that we want to do. So this entire thing is called this, this entire field that studies this, that study the many to one relationship between the instances and the labels. And this involves representing the instances uh, and how do we aggregate them and so on. This entire field is called multiple instance learning. Uh, it has been used a lot for the purpose of clustering, anomaly de detection, etc. even though uh, the example I give you here is probably uh, is, is a toy example. Like later on, we are going to go through a real world example that, that was actually the motivation uh, of this problem. Uh, but before that, let me introduce uh, some termina uh, some notations again. So maybe just, maybe just to uh, refresh ourselves, uh, this, this entire, uh, this collection of image images that we have is called back of instances. Each image is called an instance, a single instance. Uh, and what link them together is that they have one associated outcome. Uh, we have what exactly one label associated with uh, these many images. We call this group back of instances and each image inside as instance. 
Now, uh, let us set up some notations for this. So we are given a multi-instance data set with and training bags. So the training, the training units uh, in multiple instance learning are called bags. Uh, let's call this X, Y. Y is the labels associated with the back, while X are the collection of backs. So as you can see, we can label X as X1, X2, up to Xn. So this is a set, uh, this is like a collection of backs. We have N backs, and each of these backs contains, contains instances, right? So we can label each individual instance inside because Yes, we can see each of the we can see the features uh, of of each instance inside the bags. We can label them from one to up to n i. So we assume that uh, bag i will have n i instances, and the reason why we use n i here, meaning each bag can contains a variable number of instances, and so like these numbers n i vary between different bags. What, but what is constant here is the instance representation. So we assume that each of this image, each of this instance inside the back have same number of features. Uh, in this case, it's the dimensional feature. In this case, each image has a fixed resolution. All of them have the same resolution, or at least we can resize them so that they are of the same resolution. And also we can associate a set of labels for each back uh, because there are n backs. We, we also have n labels uh, in this toy example. Uh, the label is the location where the pictures are taken from. Uh, so each back are collect. So each of these back is a collection of pictures taken from the same place. So the label associated with each of these back is the location where these pictures are taken from. Uh, in some cases, we can also associate an instance label YIJ to each of these. Depending on the task, uh, this might be obvious or might not be obvious. Uh, in our task, probably we can just assign like instance label to each of these picture as their object classification. This is a body of water. This is a New Zealand crab. This is a coconut tree. But it can also be something more, right? Like time of the day or the region it might be taken from. So there are po many possible labels in this, which we'll probably explore at least like what is the easy way to, to go through uh, this, this conundrum later. Uh, but, it, but for now, just keep in mind that uh, we, can we can associate a label with the back. Usually the lab label associated with the back is uh, the one thing that we are trying to classify. Uh, but for instance, we can also associate some instance label, but this is more fluid, I must say. Yes. Uh, yes, so before we go on, I notice like there are some, there are a couple of you who have, who have just like entered the Zoom room, like probably in the middle of, I think during the middle of the presentation. So if there's anything you want to clar clarify, like just feel free to unmute and, and just like shoot me some questions. Yeah, uh, is there any way we can download and access the slides? Oh, uh, so, so I don't know, like, uh, how is this? So probably we can, I don't know, Prof. Scarlet, probably, like, are we going to upload this slide later? Or? Uh, okay, I think it's not here. Uh, yeah, so I think that should uh, so this is rather large, but I can probably like just create a Google Drive link later that can be sent to. So did you did you guys re register for this? Uh, for yeah, this yeah, yeah, I did. Okay, uh, so probably like we can probably send the, the link to you later. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, so if there's no more question, I'll continue. <coughs> yes, sorry. So yeah, so the example I gave you before uh, was, of course, it's a toy data set. It's, it's a toy example just to better illustrate like this problem. But uh, this this was actually motivated by a real problem in, in biochemistry 
in in chemistry analytical chemistry i think uh, research uh, this was first introduced in a seminal work in 1997 to predict drug activity of a molecule uh, and when we say activity here is that basically the researcher uh, during that time they were trying to detect the presence of a musky smell so this is how they measure activity so if you smell like this particular molecule and it has a musky musky smell then it has the the kind of that label of interest that you wish to distinguish from molecules that do not have a musky smell but the problem here is that uh each molecule has what we call different conformations meaning like so so the example here as you can see on the slide on the right here it's is the many conformation of uh, butane molecules uh, so I'm not a chemistry major, so this is probably like just like uh, an illustration of what it actually is about. Uh, if I'm wrong, like feel free to correct me. But the different conformations here is basically just the different like relative arrangement of this uh, molecules. Like, so if you look at the CH3 uh, molecule here on on the bottom of this butane molecule, you see like the relative degree right between this and the CH3 on top like sort of changes uh, between these molecules. They are still the same molecules in the sense that you have you still have like similar bo bonds between all these molecules. It's just like there are some slight variations in the shape of these molecules. And usually, I think like when you have a molecule of butane, uh, you'll have like this many conformations all at once. It's a mixture basically of these many conformations. So when the researchers try to label this uh, particular molecule, basically like the way he did it is by smelling the molecule, right? Try to detect if it has a musky smell or not. The thing is you're not sure which one you are detecting, right? Because when you smell the gas, for example, it's, you know that, it is a collection of all these many conformations. So when you say it has a musky smell, you can't really associate that particular smell to individually to each of these molecules. It can be that all of them has musky smell. It can be that only some of them has a musky smell, but you know, like all together, they have a musky smell. And you see that this is uh, a natural form for this multiple instance learning problem. So let us put some notations. So let us reuse some of the notations that we have before. So this butane molecule is our bag of instances. Uh, each of these bags contains, ma contains many instances, right? Variable number of instances, in fact, because different molecule might have uh, different number of conformations. So each of the conformations is actually the instance uh, on this bag. So each so as you can see, like these different conformations, we have labeled them with xi1. So suppose the, this butane molecule is the i is the i is the is back number i in our example. It contains many conformations. Sorry. Yes, and each of these conformations is is uh, they are the instances of this back. We can label them with x uh, subscript i1, i2, i3, up to i12 in this case, because there are 12 conformations of these butane molecules. Each of them is also described by uh, the same vector length of features, which we will go through a bit later. Now, we can assign a label for each of these molecule or each of these back of instances. So in this case, the label is zero or one zero meaning the molecule is non musky it doesn't have musky smell one if it has a musky smell we can also associate an instance label yij to each xij in this case uh, we can probably associate some instance label whether a molecule is musky or not whether a particular conformation is is the one that is musky or not of course like we can't really observe this directly but just keep this in mind because like this way of thinking can be useful to to uh, in order to perform this back class uh, to to classify this 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 molecule later on. So what is our learning process here? We want to learn this particular rule H. So we assume that there exists this rule, 
they will assign a back XI to the correct label. In this case, the rule tells us if we give the rule like a set of conformations of a molecule, it can tell us whether a molecule is musky or not. One particular rule, for example, is that it can try to detect like each of the instance and see if one at least one of them is musky, then the molecule is musky. But a rule also doesn't have to associate instance labels explicitly. Uh, we will go through more of these notations later. Uh, I can, yeah, we'll illustrate this better later. So you have a, you will have a clearer understanding let, later of what I mean by this. Uh, but for now, let us just maybe look through a bit uh, at the data, at the actual data uh, of this. Uh, so maybe I can better describe what is the back in this case, what are the instances and what are the features that describe like this particular data set. So as you can see here on the right, we have a table of this mosque data set. We have this column called molecule name, which is basically just the class of the molecule. We have MOS211, for example. So this particular row is associated with is associated with the molecule MOS211. And you can see there's a column that says confirmation name. So this confirmation name is it describes like the confirmation of the molecule. So each row here is actually a feature of a particular confirmation of a molecule. Uh, and so this is our instance. As you can see, this molecule MOS211 will have multiple confirmation names, right? So this is to say that this MOS211 is an example of a bag. So if we take all the row with the name MOS211, we have our bag of instances. And each instance is a row that has the same molecule name. Each instance is differentiated by its confirmation name. So row, the first row and the second row, for example, they have different confirmations, but they belong to the same molecule. So they are a case of two instances from same bag. And as we can see, each of them is described by the same set of feature. You see from F1 to F166. Uh, I sort of have, uh, so these are some features that we use to describe the confirmation. In this case, I think there are some distance features uh, of each confirmation, so like the relative position of each molecules, to, uh, of, of each uh, constituent molecules to, to each other, for example. And they're different for each instance because they're different, they're of different confirmation, and so they're of different instance. But they are just associated with the same back in this case. So let us pull out some summary statistics, right, from, from these data sets. So we have two histograms right here. The one on the left here is the number of unique conformations per molecule. Uh, so the x axis here, I think it describes like, so in this histogram, uh, let me begin by describing the y axis here, right? So the y axis here is the number of unique conformations of a particular molecule. While the x axis is how many molecules have that number of unique conformations. So if we see uh, many of these molecules have roughly have a lot of unique con have a lot of confirmations uh, some of them have probably very few like five or so uh, but we see that a lot of them have more than 80 confirmations well when we look at the number of unique classes per molecule meaning like if you see in our data there's this column called class so this tells us whether a molecule is musky or not you can see MOS211 is a musky molecule from the name. It has a class one, meaning it's musky. When we look at the instance labels, right, associated to each of the molecule, each of the instance has only one unique classes, meaning each instance associated, meaning all the instances associated with the same back has the same labels in this case. So if an instance comes from, yep, you want to ask a question? Okay, I guess not. So in this case, if you look uh, at this MOS211 with all of its many confirmations, all of them have the same label. Uh, they are assumed to be musky in this case. 
but does it mean that the molecular conformation doesn't play a part? Meaning like if a molecule is musky, then all the conformations are musky. Uh, so this is what we are trying to understand from this data. And in order to do that, we need to do some visualization. Uh, we're going to use PCA in here because like the data has a dimensionality of 165 and we can't visualize 165 dimensions effectively. So what we can do is we can do this thing called PCA or principal component analysis. So if you have, a, if you've never heard of it, basically, I'm just going to describe it like briefly, but basically what you do is you have a high dimensional data. You want to reduce it to lower dimensional one by finding like, by mapping this high dimensional data to a lower number of coordinates that captures the most of the information uh, in the high dimensional data. Uh, in this way, with the most data set that has a dimensionality of 165, you can try to reduce it to two dimensional, uh, two dimensional features because we can visualize two dimensional features easily. So this will help, of course, uh, for us to visualize uh, the data. So we do just that. And we visualize the conformations of two particular, two particular molecules here. The first one is MOS217, and the other one is non-MOSC F146. Uh, if you see the blue dots here are the conformations or the instances that comes from non-MOSC F146 molecules in here. You can see that they are sort of clustered towards the top left of this plot. Then the molecules of MOSC217 are the orange ones. They're labeled as one because they belong to a musky molecule. We can just see from the simple visualization that some of the conformations, right, of the, of the supposedly musky molecules here, they are awfully close to this conformations of the non musky molecules, which leads us to suspect that probably not all conformations from musky molecules are, are actually musky because if they are, right, then we'll expect like more of a separation, right, in, in this space. Like some of these molecules shouldn't be that close to non to non musky molecules, for example. So of course, this is just some visualization we can't really prove anything with this but we can at least like have this have that suspicion that probably not all musky molecules are not all confirmation from musky molecules are actually musky so what is one way uh, to, to approach this problem we are given a set of molecular conformations here right we for each molecule we have variable number of confirmation. So if you know machine learning, it is usually hard to deal with this kind of problem because while we only have one label for each molecule, we have variable number of confirmations for this. So our matrix is not exactly uh, regular in shape because while we only have one label for each for each molecule, we have variable number of instances and hence variable number of features for each of this uh, molecule. So what is the easy way to, to, to deal with this so that we can have like a normal data representation so that we can train our favorite machine learning classifier? The easy way to do that is of course to take average. We see that for each molecule, it has variable number of conformations, but each conformation has the same number of features. So a simple way to do this is just to take average, right, for each feature. So for example, for MOSC211, for feature F1, we can just take average of all these features across all the conformation of the state molecule. We can do the same for F2 and so on. After doing that, you see now that each of the molecule here have, we have replaced the feature F1 with average F1, F2 with average F2, and so on. So these are the average feature values across all the conformation of this molecule. 
And by doing this, we are now left with uh, equal number of features for each of the molecule. And since we have this representation for each back or each molecule, we can just apply any standard uh, single instance learning algorithm, things like random forest or just regression and so on to solve this problem. Now let us try to do PCA visualization again on this table. After we have summarized the features, we can apply PCA again. But now our plot, our plots is each of this point previously, uh, if you remember this plot here, each of this point here is an instance. But now because, because we have averaged the features for each of the back, we now have one point to describe the back. Same as before, if the point is blue, it comes from a non-musky molecule. If the point is orange, it comes from a musky molecule. We see some, from this PCA, just this PCA visualization, it seems like this should work some relatively well because we see some kind of separation here, although not too clear. Of course, this is just a two-dimensional visualization, so it's not perfect and it's not conclusive of anything. But at least from this, we can tell that if we are to just classify, if we are just to classify like these examples from just this PCA plot, we can probably draw a circular lines here in the middle to separate like the musky molecule from the non-musky molecules. And we should have a decent performance. So there is one way we can do this. We can just average all the features uh, and train a single instance classifier. We can even try to learn better feature representation. We can extract additional summary statistics. For example, previously we just extracted the mean. Uh, we can extract we can extract more features, right? We can take the variance, we can take the second, we can we can take the kurtosis, the maximum, the minimum, many things that we can do with this. We can even fit a neural network to learn this end-to-end, -end, which we'll go through later. Or we can even compare each back directly without summarize the without summarizing the representation. So from this PCA plot, you can see although we can see some degree of separation between the yellow within the orange points and the blue points it's not perfect because by just taking the average we are compressing the information right we might lose some information in the, in the process of doing so so maybe we can compare the instance between the bags directly uh, and probably we can get better results which but this is all to say that the methods that I've dem demonstrated so far falls under this broad category called back-based methods in multiple instance learning. Back-based methods are the collection of methods where the main learning process happens on the back at the back level, meaning we deal directly with the back representation instead of trying to classify each individual instance inside the back uh, directly. What we want to do is the same as before. We want to approximate the function that consider the back as one entity without needing assign without needing to assign label to individual instances. And in some of the back based methods, we can just use off the shelf single instance classifiers, uh, and they can work just perfectly fine with some of the back based method. So this is what we did before. It's called back. Uh, it's called back statistics methods, as the name suggests. What we do is we take summary statistics. So if we're given a back of instance x i with n i instances, each of these instance x i j will have the same number of features. In this case, it has k features, and when we say back statistics, what we do is we take summary statistics. For example, we did average ma mapping before. What we did is we take average per feature of this instance, because as K features, we take the average of each of the each individual feature across all the instances that we have. We can do other things like maximum. We can even concatenate the results from these two mappings. So this is our example before we apply uh, the mean, uh, we, 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 we apply back averaging before, as you can see, each molecule must do one one with its many conformations. We just take the average for each of these column F1, F2, F3, and so on. And we're left with 
one single representation for each feature for each molecule. And after we do that, after we reduce the representation such that each bag is described with the same number of features, we can train a single instance classifier by just a regression, random forest, or, or we can even try support vector classifier, knife base, you name it. But as I mentioned before, when we do this, as the name suggests, back statistics, meaning we take summary statistics, we're bound to lose some information, right? Because no matter, because if we just take finite number of summary statistics, we run into the problem of compressing this information uh, a bit, depending on the summary statistics that you take. And we lose some information. Can we do this better? And the answer is, we can, we can compare the back directly. Say we have, so one of the most popular methods perhaps in uh, single instance classifi uh, classification is the nearest neighbor methods. In nearest neighbor methods, usually your features, we assume that our features have this relationship in, in a case of classification, say we want to classify the blue points from the red points here. We assume that each red points will be clustered together, meaning they should be closer. Red points should be closer to other red points as opposed to blue points. So if we have training data with these labels and we want to classify an unseen data, we just find the nearest points in our training data. Uh, we find the nearest neighbors, there's a term. We find like multiple of them, multiple points are closest to an unseen training data. And we just see like, what is the majority of the classes of the neighbors that are closest to that thing that we want to classify? And we just classify it as such. This relies, of course, on the idea of distance. When we say nearest neighbor in this graph, for example, uh, in, this, in, this, in this plot, for example, we're relying on this concept of distance in Euclidean space. We see the red points are closer to each other in the Euclidean, in the 2D Euclidean metric. Uh, of this plot. But of course, like with this, we know that each point here is a single feature vector and the two points here are described by the same number of features and we can easily, easily measure distance between them. But when we're dealing with back of instances, we are dealing with variable number of instances between two different backs. For example, like in the example that I showed you earlier, a butane molecule has 12 conformations. Other molecules might have more conformations. And we, what we're trying to do with nearest neighbor methods here is that we're trying to measure distance between bags that contains different number of objects. And this is not as trivial. Uh, yes, so it is up to us to define like a distance function that can take in this two variable number of uh, variable number of instances between two backs and how do we meaningfully define the idea of distance. So when we say distance or metric, so maybe just like to, to make things like more formal, in this case, we're actually talking about mathematical function D that will take into two inputs. These inputs can be a back of instances, can be the instance itself, can be anything, but the requirement is that they need to satisfy some of these properties. So if the distance between two objects is zero, then they must be the same object or the same points at least. And they must be symmetric, like distance from point X to point Y must be the same as point Y to point X. And this, they must satisfy this thing we call triangle inequality. So if you have this triangle here, the distance between point X here on the left of this triangle to point Y here, which is described by this brown color, brown colored line, must be smaller than if we go from here, X, the distance of X here to this point and we go to Y. So this is what we call triangle inequality, meaning the length of any two sides must, the length of like any side must be smaller than the, the sum of the length of the other two sides. So this is like some criteria that we have for to define a distance. In fact, some of the distance functions that we usually deal with has this property, and that's why they're a distance function. 
So Euclidean distance, for example, is the classic distance that we usually use to measure the distance between two points. Is described by this is basically described by the square root of the summation of the square difference between each point uh, between each coordinates of the point that we want to measure the di uh, the distance from. Another famous example is the Manhattan distance. Here, in this case, uh, we are taking the absolute difference, the summation of the absolute difference between each of the coordinates. And so if we have two black points in here, this is equivalent by just taking like uh, a, a perpendicular route of the triangle. It's equivalent by if, if these two points form a triangle like this, Euclidean distance is equal to this green line over here where we just traverse in a straight line directly from point A to point B, while Manhattan distance is a is where we traverse like along the sides of this triangle. One way, of course, to measure the distance between our back of instances is through the use of back statistics method that we used before. Because by taking average, for example, of all the feature of the instances in our back of instances, we are left with same feature length representation for each of these bags, or in this case, for each of these molecule. As you can see, MOST11, MOST12 are two different molecules, but they have the same length of feature vectors to describe them. And in this case, we can then just apply our Euclidean distance that we have before. But as you can see from this simple PCA visualization, sometimes we tend to compress a bit of information when we do this. So we might lose out some, some informations. And so because we lose out some informations, if we just compare this, we don't get any better, right? Because like previously we said we want to compare back to back directly because we try to not lose as much information. But if we do back statistics, we can just use simple classi uh, other classifiers, for example. And the distance reflected by this is also not as good because we are summarizing some features. And so depending on the association between instance and la labels, back statistics features might not be as robust. Suppose like if, a, if our back is labeled by this rule, like if we have a single positive instance since our, inside our back, then we say that our back is positive. In this case, like with the mask molecules, if like a single molecule is musky, then we say that the entire molecule is musky. If a single conformation is musky, then the entire molecule is musky. Then if we just take average, this might not be accurate, right? Because like, what if a, a musk, what if a molecule that we label musky only has one conformation that is musky, then we are diluting the features that helps us distinguish between them, right? So can we come up with a better distance with a better distance to call, uh, distance methods to calculate between this back of variable number of objects? And the answer is yes. One way we can do this is by assuming that each back is a distribution on its own. So if you're familiar with probability, we can consider that each back is a separate probability distribution. And under this assumption, same labeled, labeled backs should have similar, if not the same probability distribution. Each instance can be taken as samples that we take from the distribution. And we can try to measure the distance between distribution instead. And there are some ways to do that in statistics. Uh, maybe two of the fam more famous ones are the Mahalanobis distance or the cauchy schwarz divergence. In this case, what we do is we measure some summary statistics. So the Mahalanobis distance, for example. So I won't go through too, too much detail. So these are some methods that you can use. And usually they rely on like extracting some, in the case of Mahalanobis distance, you're extracting some sample, sample statistics. You're extracting the means and the covariates uh, of each of these two. And you sort of measure the distance between the mean of the two bags weighted by their co uh, covariance. And in the case of cauchy schwarz divergence, you are taking all the points and sort of taking some exponential or distance of, of them. Uh, but of course, 
the problem with this back of distribution measuring distance between distribution in this way is that you rely on some quantity that are random right if you assume each back to be a distribution each instances are sampled randomly from the backs then your measurement will depend on how good the points that you sample right like the more the merrier in this case in the case of Mahalanobis distance because you're measuring the mean this quantity can be can vary a lot depending on the number of instances that you have and so in many of these cases we tend to not have as many instances uh, in our back of molecules in our back of instances like in the case of mosque uh, okay it's a bit too far but in the case of mosque data set for example we see that some of the molecules can have as low as i don't know maybe 10 instances and so like this way of measuring distance like is affected by noise a lot another way is to consider them as point sets and here we have this notion of hausdorff distance we are going to if this is a bit confusing please bear with me a bit uh, you can you can of course you can, feel free to interrupt me to ask questions but if not like we'll go through this again during the lab sessions that we're going to have shortly but yeah one way to do this is we can try to measure hausdorff distance and the Hausdorff distance between two sets, or in this case, two back of instances, is given by this quantity here. So the way we do it is that we can define a metric between two instances. It can be Euclidean distance, for example. This D of AB can be Euclidean distance. And we compute this quantity H of AB and H of BA separately, where H of AB is basically for each, uh, basically for each point in A, what we're trying to do is, we're trying to find the corresponding point in B that will minimize the distance. So for each point A here, you are measuring the closest distance here. So the diagram on the right here represents that concept where you have X and Y in this case. Uh, the, green, the green points are X and the blue ones are Y. You see that from this point in Y, you're trying to find like the point in X that minimizes its distance. In this case, it's this point over here. It minimizes a distance from this point in Y, but you want to do it for, for all points in Y. So meaning for each point in Y, you find the similar minimum distance and you take the maximum of that instead. So in this case, for example, this quantity here is definitely greater than this quantity here so this is a this is the h a b h y x in this case i guess this quantity over here but we do it the same because they're not symmetrical and we take the maximum so that this quantity is symmetrical between a b and b a the benefit of this is that it takes into account the entire content of the two x a and b uh and so instead of summarizing, we are going through each instance in the two bags, and we hopefully end up with a more robust measure of distance. But of course, this is not perfect. Hausdorff distance is sensitive to, uh, to outliers. Uh, as you can see here, here what we're doing is we're computing the distance between two sets, A and B. So suppose A is one, two, three, B is four, five, six. And suppose the distance that we use to describe the relation between the instance inside these bags are just the absolute, the difference between the, between any, uh, between the two quantities. So if we compute Hausdorff distance in this setting, uh, so this is just the formula. But what we're doing is for each point in this quantity here, for each point in A, we're trying to find a point in B that minimizes the distance. So for the number one in A here, the point in B that minimizes the distance, we have four, five, six. So the minimum difference is given by four. Same with B, same with the number two, the minimum distance is four, three is also four and so on. So if we just follow this procedure, we end up with the Hausdorff distance between A and B to be equal to three. But notice that if we replace the six from B by a very large number, 20, for example, we don't contend, we don't change the content of the set by much, right? We're just changing one element 
to be 20, which might or might not be a huge difference. You can just think of this as probably if we have some noise, for example, in our back and one of the quantity, like we have some measurement errors and it tends, it shows up very large. Then you see that the Hausdorff distance, it is now 17 from previously three. It's a lot of changes and it's affected mostly by just this number 20 here. That is to say this variant of Hausdorff distance is seems to solely determined by outliers. And one way to solve this is by, we have variants to solve this instead of taking the maximum of, instead of defining each AB previously as the maximum, we can change it to the k maximum. So we take the quantile measurement here, the k rank value so that we're not as affected by outliers. We can even take average instead of take, take maximum in order to like minimize the discrepancy. Which method works best? Of course, this depends on the data, as we will see later. So, up to this point, like, are there any questions? Okay, so if not, we'll go through next. Next is after we define our idea of distance, we can now define our idea of nearest neighbors. Previously, we used simple nearest neighbor methods, but that will also be, uh, might not be as robust. Here's some work in multiple instance learning literature introduced this idea called citation K nearest neighbor. This is inspired by citation networks. For example, like if a work is related to previous similar work, it will cite them. And if it is relevant to another work, it will be cited by similar works. In this case, in our uh, multiple instance learning setting, previously, after we have defined a distance function, if we use a nearest neighbor methods, we are basically just find the k nearest back to x. But under citation knn, we can do a bit more quality control with this. Instead of just finding the nearest back to x, we can find uh, how many backs uh, in which x is the nearest to. So we identify k closest back to x, and we also find how many backs in which x is the c closest to, and we can combine this quantity together. So the k nearest back to x, we take it as the references, and the c nearest backs in which x is closest, so, sorry, the backs in which x is closest to, we can take it as citers, meaning like how many of these backs cite x and how many backs do x cites. So we can combine this quantity together and hopefully we can arrive with a better classifier. But yeah, we'll explore this idea later in the lab. Uh, yeah, which brings us to a lab session. So I'm going to send a link to you now, uh, which is a GitHub which is like a link to, which is a link to a collab notebooks that you can access. And I'm going to go through so that we can better understand like all these examples. Like I will send it through the Zoom chat. Yeah, so feel free to click on the link, uh, to click the link on the chat, then I will, I will. So that will be for our lab one session. Uh, and I will guide you through it. Yes. Uh, and let me know probably like in the chat if, if you can't access it. Uh, yeah. So yeah, everyone, please, please go to that link now. Uh, meanwhile, like uh, I need, I need to go to the toilet uh, for a while.
Hi, yes, so can anyone? Anyone cannot access the link that, that, that I put on Zoom chat? Okay, great. Uh, okay, then let me share like my my screen. Uh, give me a moment. Yep, so this is the Collab Notebooks. So if you're not familiar with Google Collab, basically this is like an online Jupyter Notebook. So a Jupyter Notebook is like usually what we use in Python when we want to do some prototyping with models interactively. Uh, and it's it's nice because it's uh, it's divided in a, in a way that we have like all these different chunk of codes that you can like execute sequentially. And so like it is really useful if you just want to run something real fast and like debug just some part of it. Uh, but maybe I'll just like introduce you to you uh, some of the basic collab functionalities. Uh, first, if you look uh, at the top bar here, there's this uh, insert menu. You can actually insert the code cell. You can create a new code cell in here. And if you see there's a shortcut in there that you can also use to, if, if you want to do it without the mouse, you can just like type in some keys and keyboard to, to create new code cells. If you press this, like it will create the new code cells, which you can run your code to. So for example, I can do this print hello. And to run this, you can, there are several ways. If you, if you look, click on that code, you'll see this menu bar on the on the right. Okay, so this is not to run the code. So if you run, the, you can go to, I think, runtime, and you can do this, run selection, or you can also press Control, Shift, Enter. And if you click that, so first time you run some code in here, there will be this warning, this notebook was not authored by Google. Because like we're basically like loading this from my GitHub repo, uh, so you just run anyway because I can guarantee you that this notebook is safe, and we'll execute that code in which that your current selection like is set to. Might take a while because like you see the status here; it's initializing. Then it will change to connected when it is connected. It, you'll be able to run it basically. And you see there's this RAM and disk. This tells you like how much disk is available to you and how much RAM is available to you. As you can see, we have like about 12.7 gigabytes of RAM and we're assigned like what 100 gigabytes of disk. So quite plenty, especially that this is free. Yes. So once you run this code, right? Uh, you can even organize it. Like this is useful like for teaching or for presentation or presenting your report because you can order your codes in a way that uh, that is that has this flow that you want to capture right during for whatever reason you're using this uh, this this notebook so you can move the cell up and down like there's the menu here you can move up you can move down and so on so and if you do need it anymore you can click on this trash bin here delete cell and it will delete the cell for you <coughs> Okay, so for starter, I want you to run this first cell here that says git code. So what this will do is this will load the data that we're going to use for this workshop. So to run it, you can just like run shift enter. So you can run this selection, remember by this runtime, control shift enter. Or you can run shift enter so, such that if you click it, like it will immediately move to the cell after it. So if you run this, it will clone this repository, which is basically the data that we need. <clears throat> and if you click this files menu here, it will expand the bar on the left and it will show you like the data that is available to you. 
So I think each collapse session will come with the sample data that you can just use. These are the classic data that you use for machine learning. And there's this MI workshop, which is the thing that we've just cloned from GitHub that contains like the data uh, that we need. Okay, so if you've done like this basics, uh, some of these basic steps, I hope you've done it, then I'll probably brief you a bit about, I'll, oops, accidentally close the presentation. I'll brief you a bit about the lab sessions. <coughs> so for this lab session, I have created a, I've created a sample data set, a toy data set, comprises of these MNIST digits. So this is a famous problem. Like chances are if you are just learning, if you've just started with machine learning, you'll come across this data set, which is basically a data set of digits from one to nine. They are handwritten, and your purpose, your task here is to is to classify these digits. So, given a picture of one, you want to classify if this is if this is an image of one, or image of five, or eight, and so on. But to make this a multiple instance learning problem, what I do is I group some of these MNIST digits together. And each of these images are called back of instances, right? So, so each each group of image of images is called a back back of instances. Uh, we also have a label for each back. The label is positive or negative. Uh, each back contains variable number of images or instances. In this case, as you can see, like the first back has blue color, so blue color is positive. Red means negative. The first back has three images, or this other blue back has four images. But yeah, so they have a variable number of images. And our goal is to classify whether a back is positive or not. And I've actually set up a rule. So I, I group these images together and label them based on a particular rule that we hope to learn from this example. Yes. Uh, Yep, so back to our back to our Google Collab example. Okay, give me a moment. Okay, so if you're done cloning this, uh, oh yeah, but anyway, like during this workshop, right, feel free to, dur during, especially during this practical session, like if things cannot run or you encounter some problem, like just turn on your microphone and, and just like interrupt me. Just basically just let me know that it's not working. Or if your microphone is not working or you're a bit shy, you can also, you can also, you can also write on the chat, like, if, if things are not working for you. Yeah, don't, 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 don't hesitate. Like, of course you can always revisit this, uh, this notebook later, even after the workshop, because yeah, the link will always be there. You can always access it, but some, so this notebook is not complete. Like our goal is to complete this notebook. Basically we're going to write some codes so that, yeah, so we can, we can, we can implement some basic uh, multiple instance learning problem. Yeah, so anyway, after we clone this repository, next we need to run this cell. So what this do is it will import some basic library that we'll be using for this session. You just shift enter that. Run the next cell as well. So we're setting like some random seed so that uh, whatever we run here like can be easily reproduced and the same and essentially the same like for all of us. Uh, then run the next cell. So this cell that has a lot of things in it. Uh, don't worry, I'll go through them. What this do is basically, so if you have cloned this MI workshop folder correctly, this will then load all the data that we need 
uh, for this, for, for the purpose of this exercise. Uh, let me go through some of them that is important. If you see first, like there are several, there are only several, several things that are important in here. You see, there's this thing called X train, X test, Y train, Y test, and you have train bags, train labels, test bags, test labels. And you have this MNIST array train, MNIST array test. So it seems like a lot of features, uh, a lot of variables, right? Uh, so I'll go through them one by one so that this will be clear and not confusing like to some of you. So if you create a cell like underneath this and we look at MNIST array train and you execute it, like you'll see like a bunch of numbers. Uh, they don't necessarily make sense, but this is actually like the picture of the image. So if you want to visualize them, we can just run this command. So we can write plte.mshow. So this is basically uh, one of the library in Python to visualize image. We can take this MNIST array train uh, array variable. You write square bracket zero. So what we're doing here is that we're accessing the first entry from this array and this array train. And if you don't know Python, Python is basically zero index base. So the first row in this array starts from zero instead of one. So when we type MNIST array train zero, we're accessing like the first row of this. Then you type dot reshape bracket 2828 and you close bracket. So what we're doing here is we take the first, we're taking the first array from the, uh, the first entry from MNIST array train. We reshape it such that it has 28 rows and 28 columns. And we just run enter and voila. And you have this picture. So this is not clear. This can be a six or a rotate at nine. But basically what I want to show here is that this MNIST array train contains the actual image uh, of the MNIST digits. So if you, you can change the row, you can change to one, you can change to five, for example. It will display different digits because they correspond to different digits. So we see that at the fifth row of MNIST array train, it's a digit two, right? Uh, then you can create another cell here. Now look, let us take a look at this variable white train. You see that white train is just a bunch of numbers, but if we access the same row of, uh, as this MNIST array train, say five, you see two, which is like the same as this image here, right? In fact, if we change this to 15, we plot it and we access the 15, we ac access 15 of white train, we see the same digit. So what I'm saying here is that white train here is the label for individual image that corresponds. So each row of this white train is the digital label of this row of MNIST array train, basically. So that's that. So now I'll, I'll delete this. Uh, you don't have to run the next cell here because this will take a while. But what I'm doing here is that because Google Colab doesn't always come with the library that you want to use, what you can do is you can install them. If you put like exclamation mark here, what you're doing is you're running bash commands in here. In this case, I'm installing a library from Py Python package managers. And what I'm going to do next is I've actually visualized it here. So the purpose of this is that remember after we have this MNIST array train, MNIST array test, so this train and tests are just like, you know, the train and test set that we're going to use. Or later we're going to train on just the training data, but we're going to test on the test data. We have white train and white test that corresponds to the digit labels of MNIST array train and MNIST array test. 
But the features that we're going to be dealing with will be X-Train and x -Test. If you say X-Train, right? It's just a bunch of numbers. They are floating point numbers. And they don't seem to make sense. Like if you do xtrain.shape, you see that it has 20,000 rows and 64 columns. So this is definitely not an image. But if you plot this with this function that, so you, again, you don't need to execute this. This will take a while to run. So I've run it for you. But if we just take this and visualize this in the in the 2D plot, so this is similar to the PCA examples that I showed before. Uh, we see some clustering in here. So the labels here basically are the labels of the digits. And you see that this X train is clustered by the digits. You see the digit ones are clustered together, the digit sevens are clustered together, the digit zero are clustered together. So what I'm doing here is that, because we only have limited compute uh, for Google Collab. <clears throat> so in order so, so the, in order for us to be able to execute all this code, I've set it up such that uh, we will, so I've, I've compressed basically, I've, I've compressed like the MNIST array train, which is all the pixels of an image to this X train that has lower dimensionality. So, if you write MNIS array train that shape, you see that this has 784 features. Now we only have 64 features, which is way less. They have the same number of rows because each row of MNIS array train corresponds to the same row in X train. <clears throat> but you see that we still capture some of the most essential information with this X train. As you can see, like roughly the digits same digits tend to cluster together. So I've performed some dimensionality reduction here. Uh, actually, I did this with the self-supervised learning method, which I won't go through here, but if you're interested, you can just ask me later. I use this thing called SimCLR method, uh, which basically the idea is you want to compress like this dimensionality while still capturing some semantic meaning of the data. But, but for the purpose of this, just know that even if we use X train, which is like a lower dimensional form of this MNIST array train, we still capture most of the information in our data. Uh, and next, so we have visual, visualized MNIST array train. We also have Y train. We have X train. Now we have one other variables that we haven't seen and it's called train labels and test labels. So you can just print, right? You can just print their outcome. You can do this. Square bracket dot five, uh, colon five. What we're doing here we're, is we're printing the first five entry of these two variable. And if we just control enter them, we see like, these numbers, these different numbers, one and zero. So the train labels here are basically the labels associated with the train backs and test labels are labels associated with the test backs. So I haven't shown you train backs and test backs, which we'll do now. We can similarly print this too. And you see that train backs, at least the first five entries are just a list of random numbers here. And this number actually corresponds to the index in our training data. So if you see X train, you write dot shape. Again, we see that X train has 20,000 rows. So you can access the rows in X train, right? By imputing the index. So if you want to access the first row, you type X train zero, and you'll end up with the first row of X train. You can actually access multiple rows from X train. So for example, you can pass a list to X train. You can type X train square bracket, square bracket zero, five, seven. So we've passed, we've passed in a list of three items to X train. And as you can see, we get 
three rows from X train that corresponds to first row, six row, and eight row, or row index zero, five, and seven. So I've mentioned to you earlier that I've grouped some of these MNIST digits together uh, to form a back of instances, right? So that back of instances are described by this variable called train backs. So these train backs, uh, if you access train back zero, for example, this tells you what are the indices that you have to take from X train in order to form the first back or back number zero? So to access the back number zero, what you do is you pass X train and you type in train backs, then you type in the row number that you want. In this case, is row number zero, right? You press enter. It will give you all the features of back number zero. So if you type shape here, you have a feature with length 13 and dimensionality 64. So what this tells you is that the first back, back number zero has 13 instances and each of them has 64 features. What is the back, what is the label of back number zero? Well, that is given by train label, label zero, which is one. So we know that back number zero as a label of one. Similarly, we can access back number one, back index one. It has eight instances and it has label zero. So that is sort of how we play with the variables here. So next, what we can do is we can visualize the distribution of labels in the train in the training sets and in the test sets. Uh, so how do we do that? So we can do that by plotting it uh, in this way. So you can just like follow after me and type figure access by plot subplots, uh, one, two, figure size 10 and five. So what I'm doing here is that I'm creating two axes to plot our object. You don't need, you, for now you just have to follow me. Like it's a bit complicated to explaining this plotting function here, but you can do access hist, where we can plot histograms. First is train labels. Next one, we can plot test labels and we can just press enter. And we'll have a plot of, we, we will have a histogram. So if you say X is zero here. So I've plot like, I've created two plots in here. The first plot corresponds to train labels. The second plot in here corresponds to test labels. And this plot is a histogram of their labels. Remember, our train labels is just an array of zero and one, right? So this tells us the class distribution between the training set and the test set. And as you can see, they are sort of uh, equal between the two, which is good because then if we train like our model in the training labels, we can be sure that it might work well. If it can perform well, rather well in training labels, then it, it might perform rather well in the test labels. Next, let, let, let us look at the distribution of instances in the training and the test set. To do this, we can just like copy this plotting function here to create the access object. Then you can do access zero dot histogram. Then you can do this land back for back in train backs. And for the next one, you can do access one histogram, a list land back for back in test backs. I can just enter. And you'll see this plot here, which tells you. So what I'm doing here is that I'm going through for every element in train backs, which we call back, and I'm measuring like the length of this of that element. Remember, like if I access a particular element in train backs, say the first element, it has this many 
uh, indices, right? So they correspond to how many instances you have in a bag. So what I'm plotting here is I'm plotting the distribution of the number of instances per bag for each of the training and the test bags. And we see that most of them, they, they, they seem to have like equal number of instances as well. Uh, you see like they seem to have anywhere between seven to eight, 14 instances inside each bag. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yes. Sorry yep. to but uh, maybe you already explained this before. But the mm -hmm. test, the train and test labels, right? Zero and one. Mm -hmm. Uh, what does it actually correspond to? Yes. So right now, uh, so I have like a particular way of assigning them. Our task here is to know what it is. So after this, we're going to visualize a bit like what they correspond to. I guess. Uh, some hints they. So because this is a toy data set, so I've created some rules uh, for this. And we are going to try to visualize them later. So if you execute the next cell, right, there's this visualize backs function. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're trying to visualize the label of the back. So if you execute this code so that you can have this function. And you can just run this function here. So here I have a sample run of this function. You can see like we're plotting each instance in each bag. Uh, the title of each row is like the back label. So this is the back label number one. And this shows that, sorry, so this back label is one. And this back label here, the third one is zero. So these are the labels. And you're printing every instance uh, in these labels. This way we can sort of try to like form a hypothesis, right? And what are the... Uh, what are the bags? Uh, what are the instances like uh, contained inside of these bags? So you can just run this function multiple times, like to just like look through look, look through the image. Like maybe this will help, right? Uh, to to form a hypothesis. Like so, this is like to answer your question uh, before in Chan Hong. Like can try to visualize this, like run this multiple time, and like just take a look. Like what are the compositions of the positive backs, the, the back label one that is different from back label zero. So I think I'll, I'm going to give you some time to, to, to play around with this. Uh, yeah, maybe let's spend like five minutes uh, in here. Uh, meanwhile, like if you're done with this, you can also uh, maybe go for a quick toilet. And if you have any question, like feel free to ask me uh, directly or in the chat, yes. Yep, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to the toilet first.
Yes, hi. So anyone want anyone want to guess like what is the rule like in assigning the bags? Okay, so if you visualize this closely, right, you'll notice that back label one, right, tends to have a lot of nines. While back zero usually, I mean, if you're lucky, I think you'll have like some nines, but they tend not to have like the number nines. So if we do this repeatedly, if we run this again, for example, Again, like back label one seems to. So if you have three nines, like it's still a back label one. Uh, so yeah, we don't have. So we know that probably like there are a lot of nines in back with label one. We don't know how many nines are needed to form like back label one as opposed to back zero. But we know that yes, it has something to do with the digits nine. So for example, like see back label zero here, we have a digit nine. Here, back label zero, we have a digit nine. So definitely, like it seems like one number of one digit nine is not enough for this. Uh, well, if you have like three or I don't know, here we have seven digits of nine. Like seems to be labeled one. So it has something to do with that. Uh, so next, what we do is we're going to try to apply the back statistics method. So if you remember from the slides, like we know that each of the back has variable number of instances. So one way so that we can have like a fixed representation for this is that we can try to extract some summary statistics uh, from the backs. Here I've created a function to extract uh, some summary statistics. Uh, and for you to do it, you just need to run this cell and you run the cell afterwards. So I'm going to explain to you a bit uh, I've created some function here to extract the statistics. So this function is called extract summary statistics. It will take in x train or x test. We uh, see the features that we're working with. It will also take the train backs, the back, uh, basically like the back indices that we have before, and it'll accept like a function. So these are some functions that I passed uh, to. Uh, this will like basically what this function will do is so the first function here is numpy mean this will take an average of the features of all the instances within the back variance will take the variance and kurtosis will take the kurtosis you can play around with this of course you can even you can you can pass in maximum function, you can pass in minimum function, and so on. But for the purpose of this, we're just gonna be looking at this tree for now. And you can run this, and this will extract the summary statistics for you. So after we have this right, what we want to do next is we want to assess the the quality of our representation. So one way to do it is like what we did before uh, in the slides is to extract a PCA, uh, is to extract like a, a two-dimensional PCA representation and visualize them. So now let's run PCA. So we have imported the necessary function to run PCA. Is this two over here? Uh, from this library called sklearn, we have imported function PCA, another one called standard scalar. This is because uh, when we run PCA, right, we expect our input, we expect our input to be Z normalized. And by that, I mean, if we have a variable X, we're supposed to, we're supposed to normalize it by subtracting its mean. Uh, and divided by its standard deviation. So basically we're trying to compute this quantity here. We're dividing by the mean and we are subtracting by the mean and dividing by standard deviation before we pass it to PCA. 
and we can do this. We can actually learn the mean and the standard deviation. We can compute it our own, but we can also use this standard scalar object from a scalar. We can just call it standard scalar, initiate it, and we can run this fit method, x train stats. So what this do is then the standard scalar will learn the mean and standard deviation of the variable x train stats and store it for later use. Next, we can then create right a normalized version of extra stats. Let's call it extra stats normed. And to do this is that we can use the newly fitted scalar object. We call this method transform to extra stats. Similar, similarly, we can do it to x test stats to form x test stats norm. We do scalar dot transform x test stats. And after this, we're going to have like a scaled version of x train stats and x test stats, x test stats. Next, we want to fit a PCA here. So what we do is we create a PCA object, initiate PCA. Uh, we can put number of components equals to, well, we can just leave it blank for now. We can just run the same method, dot fit, you pause in, X train stats norm. Then we can create. So this this line here will fit. We'll learn the PC. We'll we we'll learn like the necessary transformation that you need to transform our X train stats norm into a PCA representation. Then we can put X train PCA equals to PCA object the transform X train stats norm. We can do the same for X test. Then you can just run it. This should run relatively fast because PCA is relatively fast to learn uh, to uh, to run. After you run this cell, you can run the cell below, and what it does is it will plot basically the PCA representation using the summary statistics method. And it will distinguish, it will, it will also like tells you which point belongs to label zero, which points belong to label one. And as you can see from this plot, seems like our representation is not bad, right? Because even in the PCA space, you can see that if we just, if we're just to draw like a straight line here, separating the two, we already have a decent performance for the classifier. Uh, but next, we want to see the performance here with x train stats. So what we can do is we can train a simple classifier. So run the cell next to it and also the next one. So I've created some functions here to measure the performance. We are basically tra tracking three performance. The first is the area under the Brock curve. The next one is area under the precision recall curve. So this tells you like the average trade off sort of between like your sensitivity or the specificity or of your model. Well, this, this tells you the trade off between your precision and your recall, like meaning like how many false positive that you have, like as you make your predictions more stringent or less stringent and so on. But basically the idea is that for these two numbers, the higher, the better. Then we have accuracy or balance accuracy or sort of how many times your model predicts correctly. This is balance accuracy because we have uh, we don't have equal number of posit uh, label one classes and label zero classes. So this will balance, uh, this will take into account the discrepancy to create like a more balanced metric for the performance or, of our model. So next we can try to, oh, hi, uh, sir, sir, I've just read the chat. So I read Aruna is asking, uh, join lately and whether I have a copy of the notebook. Uh, yes, I can, I can copy the link here. So you can click on that link to access the notebook. Uh, yeah. 
So I think like if you are late here and you don't know how to fill up the notebook, like I'm going to update the the GitHub later. I'm 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 also going to uh, send send to all of you the GitHub link later so that you can go through on your own. I'll I'll up, I'll give you the completed notebook later on as well. So don't worry. And we also have like more lab sessions later. Perhaps like I can go through some of the some of the concepts again a bit. I can, we can we can revise it again like in lab two and lab three, uh, a bit for 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 the benefits of those who attended late. So no worries in there. Yes, but for now let us try to do a simple classification with our back of statistics approach. So remember our our variable x train stats. So we are going to train a classifier that take this into account, this variable into account, and yeah, do some simple classification basically. In this example, I'm going to use logistic regression, which is a relatively one of the more popular classifiers that people tend to use as a benchmark for their results. So you can assign this as this logic. We can instantiate logistic regression. You can then call just call dot fit to extrain stats and yes. Uh, and of course, right, we pass it the label because this is a supervised learning problem. We need to pass it a label so that the model can learn to assign like which ones are the correct uh, labels associated with each back representation. So we pass the train labels as the label. And you can just fit this. Uh, then simply after you do this, right, you can perform a prediction. So we can do this Y test spread, which is a prediction in the test data. You can just like use logit this logic, let's call it the log, log it classifier, which is the classifier that you trained before. Then call this method dot predict. You pause in x stats, x test stats. So this will give you the label that model thinks is true for our x test stats variable. Then we can also compute the probability for this. Uh, so this y test prediction. Okay, so before that, maybe we just try to print the accuracy first. We do get accuracy. We pass it the label, which is test labels, which are the true labels. And we pass a Y test spread, which is a prediction, and we just run that cell. Shouldn't take long. And we get a number of 82.3% balance accuracy. So this is like saying, if we have equal number of positive po uh, label one, uh, examples in our training data and label zero examples, and we ask our model to predict, we'll get them correct 83, 82.3% of the time, which is a not bad performance, I guess, for this very simple classifier, knowing that we only take a few lines to train this. We can also measure the rock AUC and the PR AUC, but to do that, if you see a white test spread, it's a variable that is just zero and one, for rock curve and PR curve, we need probability because what this measures is that it will try to adjust the threshold for your probability of prediction and measure like whether increasing the stringentness will like improve your performance or not. So in order to do that, we need this white test spread probability, which we can do by calling this method from our logic classifier, predict proba, positive X test stats. Then we can print the rock AUC and the PR AUC. So again, the label is test labels, white test. And we can do similar thing with precision recall. Just do prediction. Okay, I pass it the wrong variable name, so it's prop. Okay. So this method, right? It takes a single probability, uh, basically the probability of like the probability that our classifier outputs that a given example is of label one. But if you see our 
white test spread probability here. It has two columns. What we're interested in is just this like second column here. So to access just the second column, the white test spread probability, what we do is we put square bracket at colon, comma one. So this means that we're taking all the rows, but we're just accessing the first column of white test spread probability. And we can execute that. And we get a very good rock AOC and precision recall AOC actually. So one is the perfect number for this. Uh, so this is really good actually in our case. And if you want to assess like the contribution of each summary statistics, next we can run this cell here. So this entire cell has been commented out. So if you want to run this, you can block everything. You can do control backslash to uncomment everything. Or if you don't know how to do that, I guess you can just like erase line by lines, but it'll take too much time. So what you can do is you can just select everything and control slash, sorry, not, sorry, not backslash. So slash is the one like below your question mark key in your keyboard. So you do that. And you can just press enter and just wait a bit for this to run. And I'm going to explain to you the output. So this will output table, right? So what this code does here is that, uh, this will run uh, several This will run like a model like throughout the, this will run your model with different uh, statistics, uh, test statistics mentioned. So you see we have like all possible combinations of the three test statistics, the mean variance and kurtosis. And we're just like taking some permutations of, of them and just like checking the results on the test accuracy, uh, on, the, on the test set. And here this table is like rank you, like which one has the highest balance accuracy up to all the way to the lowest. And we can see that a balance accuracy of 0.5, meaning like it's no better than random. So you're just predicting randomly whether back is positive or not. And that our variance seems to have that performance meaning. And if we see like the performance of the model that has variance and the one that doesn't have variance. So for example, you see kurtosis with variance and kurtosis, they're very close performance. Mean and mean, mean variance, they have essentially the same performance. Mean kurtosis and mean variance kurtosis, they have the same performance. This says that variance probably not a really good indicator for for this problem, but luckily our model can can of course like disregard the features because they're not very useful and just focus on the more important ones. But this is one way you can do, you can you can try like if your training data is not huge, you can create a separate validation set and see like which features perform the, the best. So I'm going to give you time, I guess, like to, to run this and look through. Uh, let me know like if you encounter any problem. Uh, bef then after that, I'm going to go through the, the next part of this, uh, this lab session.
Okay, so if there are no questions, I'm going to, I'm going to go through like the next part of this uh, this exercise. Uh, so remember, like previously, when we do back statistics, uh, what we do is we extract some summary summary statistics, right, from the data, be it the mean, the variance, and kurtosis. But we're summarizing those features across all instances inside the back, and this sort of uh, compresses like our representation, and so we tend to lose a bit of information. As you can see, we have a decent performance, eighty-two uh, percent, not too bad. But the question is, of course. Can we do better? And right now we still don't know if this is possible, but maybe we can try like a method that we went through before, the Hausdorff distance, <coughs> which this Hausdorff distance basically try to uh, take into account like all the instances inside each back and measure some distance that tries to cap capture as many instances as possible in the two back of instances that we have. Uh, so this is a reference for you if you don't remember the formula. So we have several Hausdorff distance that we're going to implement here. The first one is the maximum Hausdorff distance, second one is the minimum, and the third one is the average. And we're going to compare like which one has the highest performance. Uh, so I'm not going to have you implement this from scratch because this is a bit uh, involved. Uh, but what you can do is, what we can do is you can run this function. And you can run this. So this will instantiate, initiate like the function that we're gonna, going to use to compute the host of distance from the train back to the task backs. Next, you can run this cell, which will compute the host of distance. We are computing three Hausdorff distance here, maximum, average, and minimum. You see this bar will tell you the progress of the run. So all of you can run this uh, and then I'll run this and wait for the results. Meanwhile, I'll try to go through some of the codes uh, that I've written for this. Uh, sorry, sorry, just one question to clarify. Yes. So in this distance function that we are doing, um, mm -hmm. am I right to understand that for each test instance, we calculate the distance to each test, each train back. Yes, correct. Okay, okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah, so thanks for asking that question. So what we're measuring here is that we're trying to measure the distance from each train, uh, from each train back to each test back. Because like our goal is to classify our test back, right? So we want to find like the nearest neighbors uh, of the test backs to the train backs that we have. So we have several mode here. We have maximum, average, and minimum. If you have more time later, you can even run like these two commented out lines in here. Basically, I commented them out because it will take a bit longer. I think like it will take five minutes to run each one of this. Uh, yeah, so probably I'm going to go through some of the functions first. So if you remember Hausdorff distance, we rely on defining like this distance between the instance D of AB. And the one that we're using here is gonna be the Euclidean distance. And in this function, so remember X train and X test is just a list of instances, right? But in Hausdorff distance, we sort of have, need to compute distance between all instances anyway. So we can do what we can do is we can compute this pairwise distance between x test and x train. So this will give us a matrix in which each row and column corresponds to the distance between a particular uh, between a particular instance in x test and a particular instance in x train. So that's what we're doing by computing this pairwise distance. Now, for each of the test back, we need to compute the distance from each test back to each train back. So how do we do that? If you remember, there are several ways to compute this with Hausdorff distance. We can take maximum, we can take the minimum, or we can take the average. So each of this line here corresponds to different modes. So if the mode is maximum, we're going to do with this first example in here. If the mode is average, 
we're going to go through with this one particular one and if the mode is minimum it'll be this example so for each test bag we can compute like which of these matrix contains like the distances that we need and it is given by this per wise distance and we access the test bag in the index uh, so maybe in your free time you can go through this in a bit more details so here i'm just going to illustrate illustrate it to you but these text test bag instances are basically we're extracting all the instances that corresponds to a particular test bag and here we have the pairwise distance which is the distance between each bag so this test bag instances contains the distance from each instance inside this test bag to all possible instances from all the train bags so to summarize that we need to iterate again through all the possible bag in the train bag and each time we're taking either the minimum the maximum of the minimum as as, as like computed by this formula here and like we're building basically the distance like one to one like from 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 each test bag so that is basically what we're doing here uh i think it's a bit hard to explain this in details uh but for now like you can just go through the function like if you have any question maybe you can email me later i guess but yeah if you finish running this we'll have like three variables that basically says the distance back distance is max average and minimum we can take a look at this we can take a look at back distance is max we can just print that and you'll have this array right uh with numbers inside you can run dot shape on them we see that there are 900 rows and 1825 columns now if you look at test bags the length of test bags you see that there are 900 test bags and 1825 train bags which you know they seem to coincide with this number of rows in the back distances max and the number of columns in back distances max right so what this gives you is that if you access back distances max zero this will give you the first row of this variable and there will be 1825 numbers in here so each of these corresponds to distance from this aspect so back distance is max zero. So this is we're looking at the distance of test back zero to all train backs. So the first number here is the distance to train back zero. This is train backs one, train backs two, and so on. The same goes for all the variables here. Next, I've created a function that will take in these distances and output the prediction. So you just need to run this. And to get our prediction, we need to run this get k nearest neighbor function, which we can do that. So first let us define a number of neighbors. So we have 900 test backs, we have 1800 train backs. So let's set a number of neighbors to 15. Uh, and let's take y test pred equals to get kn and pred. So this will get the k nearest neighbor prediction. Uh, you put in the train labels, put in the test labels, as you can see from this function description here. And we can take the back distance. In this case, let's work with back distances max first and you fit it with number of neighbors so what this will do is that this will look at back distances max for each test back in this back distances max it will find the 15 nearest train backs and it will determine the labels of each of the test back inside this back distances max 
it will determine the label based on uh, the strain labels. So if the train labels, so if the 50 nearest neighbors, for example, to a test back is like 13 positive, uh, 13 ones and two zeros, they will assign, then the, this function will assign a label of 13 to, to that back. So you can just run this. And you'll get this white as spread, which again is an array of zero and one. You can run dot shape as 900 entries. Which again, if you remember, is equal to the length to the length of this test back variable. So this is the label for each one. Now we can try to print the balance accuracy. Get accuracy score. You can put test labels and white test spread. Okay, I'm using the wrong function name, sorry. Uh, it sh should be get accuracy, yes. So not get accuracy score, but get accuracy. And you can just print that. 71%, which is far below, if you remember, to our this mean kurtosis model, which give us 82.3%. But we haven't tried all the other methods, right? So what what we can do here is we can try again. We can copy the cell, paste it to the cell below. Can try change max with minimum. Run this. And you can do the same with back distances average. So you can run this. And if you see the performance of average is like seems to be way higher, right? It gives you about 91%, which is higher than our previous method of using summary statistic. So the question is why like our back distances average performs well, way better than the back distances maximum. And to answer this, we need to remember when we do this visualization. If you see this back label one, This has a digit of nines, probably a lot of them, right? Uh, and when we do closest distance, right? We know that when we take maximum, back distances maximums, we know it is very prone to outliers because we're basically just taking the maximum of the distance. We know that positive back contains multiple nines, but if we only have one nine, this back label will be zero. But this might, this a single observation of nine might actually influence distance a lot. And that's why when we do maximum, it can probably recognize back that has a digit nine, but we know that if it contains a digit nine, might not mean that it will be label uh, one. And that is why perhaps like, that perhaps explains like the discrepancy uh, in the performance uh, between the two. Uh, sorry, quick question, right? Yep. Uh, you, even though you explained that way conceptually, I understand, but the average, when you talk about average, isn't the average is it referring to the average of the digits or average of the okay. pixel so, data inside the images? Because I'm a bit confused. Yes. Okay, so when we say average here, right, is so if you refer to this, uh, to this one, right, the way we measure Hausdorff distance is that we sort of compute pairwise distance between each instance. So in this case, we compute pairwise distance between each image in the in the in the back, right? But when we say maximum, right? Uh, for each of this distance, if you notice, sorry, you are just taking like one value. So for each A B here, for example, for each instance in A, you are just you're just taking like one particular value in A for each particular value in B and you just take the maximum. Oh, okay, okay, I see. I see. Well, in here, you are sort of considering all the A instead of just taking the maximum, you sum them up together and you take average. I see. Yeah. So, so if there are two backs with one image that are exactly the same and uh, most likely we map to each other if they yes. just have the maximum 
values for that one, right? Yep, correct. Okay, sure. But the maximum value is we are talking about is for on the pixel level on the image, right? Yeah, not so we're not using the the pixel directly, but you can think of it as that, I guess. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, sure. Yeah, we're using like some different representation, but like the idea should still be similar. Like digits of nine and nine, like they should be close to each other. Okay, okay. Yeah, the compositions are somewhat similar. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. But this, okay, sure. I, I, I think I get it. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so that is for the k nearest neighbors algorithm. Uh, so next, I've also provided a function for this thing called citation KNN. Uh, and this will, so if you remember like the example, so with k nearest neighbor, what we're doing is for each test label here, we're just finding the nearest train labels. With citation KNN, we're also considering the number for which the test labels the test labels are among like the closest neighbors to some data entering labels. So this is like two way relationship. So it's like something that we add on top of this k nearest neighbors for robustness sake. Uh, so the function like is similar, but we need to this define this additional variable called citation neighbors. So let's just put that equals to five now we can try to execute the function so just copy this you can run y test spread equals to this one and similarly we can print the accuracy and see some results oh sorry you're supposed to change this variable with so let's try back average back distance average in here just print the result Hmm, something is wrong. Give me a moment. Oh, okay, I think I'm running the wrong function. Sorry. Uh yeah, so I've not made it made this easy, sorry. You actually have to add something on it. So maybe you can look a bit like at this. Let's not call this white as spread. Let's call this white as count. And we just execute this and we can inspect this array white as count. So if you see right, white as count has two numbers. Like each row here has two columns. And this is basically what this function get citation KNN Fred gives you is the total number of negative backs and positive backs that are closest to it. So the first column is the number of negative backs, second column is the number of positive backs. So we'll classify if we'll classify negative if there are more negative backs, we'll classify positive if there are more positive backs. How do we count this number? So if you look at the first row here, we see the number 13, right? This 13 is equals to the number of neighbors. So this 13 is equals to the number of neighbors of back for which they are uh, negative. And you add them with the number of backs for which test backs are among. So because number of citation neighbor is five, five closes neighbors to. Okay, so I can make this into a text, sorry. So I'm going to explain a bit like what the numbers you see from this get citation again and pred function do. So basically what essentially you're doing is for each class zero and one, which corresponds a column, of course, you're computing the number of neighbors. You're computing two numbers here. Previously with k nearest neighbor, we're just computing the number of neighbors, the, num the labels, we're just computing like the first quantity here. 
So we have two number, right? 13. 13 here is the number of neighbors of this back of the first back, first test back, for which those backs are negative. But in this citation KNN framework, we want to consider the other relation to make this prediction more robust. So what we're doing is we're adding it with a number of backs for which our first test back here are among the five closest neighbors to. So meaning like, what are the things that cite like this particular back? So ideally like they should be high if this back is negative or low if this back is positive. So we compute this value, this, this numbers for the two. And then we can form white test prediction by taking which column has more counts. We can do that by doing this numpy.argmax y test count and put axis equals to one. What this function do is basically just taking which column. So it will output like which column has the higher numbers between the two for each row. Then we can print the accuracy as before, which will give us 86% for this back distance average, which if you realize, is not as high if we're just taking the k normal k nearest neighbor. Intuitively, we know this should be higher, but we don't observe that. And the question is why this is the case. So my hypothesis for this is that if we're just applying this nicely, meaning you're computing like how many neighbors, you're, comp you're computing this quantity, right? Uh, you're computing the number of neighbors back for which they're negative. If you realize this number of neighbors is constant, right? It's 15 for this particular back. So for each back, you're computing like 15 nearest neighbors. So for all these test backs, this number is comparable. Like they're comparable across the test backs. But this number, number of backs for which the test backs are among the five closest neighbors to, this might not be comparable between different aspects. What do I mean by that? Let's, let's try to look at this scatter plots in here, which represents the back, right? And let's take, let's just take some arbitrary points, like say these blue dots over here. If you see these blue dots over here, it is located in a high density regions, meaning it is surrounded by a lot of points compared to the blue dots over here that, that is far away from the rest. When we're computing the nearest neighbor of each point, it doesn't matter if they're located in high density region or low density region, because you're setting a fixed number of closest neighbors and this point will have five closest neighbors. This will also have five closest neighbors by definition. But if you're looking at the number of points in which they are the closest neighbor to. Obviously, like points are located in higher density regions will tend to have more neighbors in which they're closest to, right? Compared to points in sparser regions. So what it means is that when we're comparing the quantities between these two points are located in different regions, these numbers might be biased, right? Towards the numbers there, towards the points there, Closely, they are located in this high density regions as compared to this. And this will, of course, like skew this prediction and make this not really comparable if we want to use this to test between each back. So what do we do to, to, mitig to mitigate that? So what we can do is we can normalize the counts. So here I've created another function to do that. And what that function do is it will, as before, it will get the citation counts. Uh, it will get the citation counts. And instead of just using it as an absolute number, it will divide it by the number of backs. Meaning like if this back, if a particular, if this back, for example, is is has like five backs in which it is among like the closest neighbors to, 
it will divide the numbers by like the number of positive and negative labels so that it will give you a more normalized prediction, something like that. Uh, so we can try to run that function. Uh, again, same as before, we can copy this, put it here and replace this get citation can and pred function with a normalized version. And you can run this. Okay, so you have to execute this cell first. Then you run the function. And you see this white as count right now is a floating point number. This will give you an average score. This will give you the normalized number of backs in which like this particular back is closest to. So this will sort of normalize like if you're located in high dense region or lower density region. And again, uh, sorry, so you put nearest number equals to here, 15, and citation number equals to citation numbers. Then you can compute the white test prediction by computing this arcmax of white test count, and you can print the accuracy. And you get a much higher number than if you're just doing the KNN. Because in this way, we're not biased towards points that are located just in high, high region. And that's why we get like better accuracy because we are normalizing for that. So as a last exercise, you can you can you can try to comment out this column. Sorry, you can you can block this except like the first row in here. Comment them out, which finally I can do with. Hmm. It's weird that I cannot comment this out. Okay, I think something's wrong, but hmm, what I'm I'm just going to erase this line by line. Okay, so if you have erased this one, we just have to erase this comment out variables. Okay, so it's a bit messy, it might be some bit for you to run but I'm just going uh, but I think it's fine I can just run it on my own and the point is that like you can run this uh, we can we can we can try to run this like for some several like experimental setups uh, maybe a comment out this q07 and q08 because we didn't compute this before. And what I'm showing you here. Hmm. Okay, there's a problem here. So, okay, I'm just going to copy like another version that I have. That is, so you can, So I'll upload like the, the corrected version later on, uh, on on GitHub, which you can just access later. Uh, but for this, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run this, basically just to show you like how the performance of each bag compares to each other. So we're going to remove this. Yes. And as you can see, if we look at the balance accuracy, so this is our performance from before. We have about 90% accuracy using average distance on just Kainer's neighbor. And higher accuracy when we are using this. Uh, so, so maybe to use the same parameters, here's five. We have high, higher accuracy when we run it on the citation KNN. As, and you can see with the normalized citation KNN, this improved the performance across all kind of distance. Although some distances, of course, like, tends to perform better than rest. So what's the main learning point from this, from here? Uh, so this distance methods, when you have like bags that are not labeled as simple. So for example, in our case, our bag is positive or is label one if it contains like a lot of nines inside uh, and label zero otherwise. 
this like this is some higher level concepts, right? Because like you need some thresholding, like minimum number of an image of nine, for example, for it to be labeled positive. And if it doesn't exceed that threshold, it will be labeled negative. It's a bit complicated. So this distance function, of course, like will vary depending like on how you label that. In this case, like maximum, we can sort of intuitively tell that it won't perform as well because we know how the back are how the bags are being labeled. In this case, average seems to be a better choice in this example. But say if we if we only require like one digit of nine for for a bag to be labeled positive, then we can we can easily see like how this maximum might be maximum distance can be like a more tempting option for this right because it sort of like captures the assumptions that we have but of course when we're dealing with real life data we don't necessarily have this information and it's always good to know a lot of methods like for example so so the aim of this is basically just to show you like how the performance of these different methods can change with different assumptions like in the next lab sessions i'm going to have like a different set of assumptions and so the results will vary a lot so it's always good to have like a lot of tools in your arsenals and to try them uh yeah for for this yeah depending like of course like with your depending on, on the domain knowledge that you have with the, with the data and the task that you want to do yep uh, I, I have a question on okay. the citation k and n Yes. So the way I understand it, I think from your explanation, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is that the citation canon intuitively is better because it uh, uses bi-directionality of yes. the closest neighbors, right? Yep, correct. Okay, okay, sure. Yes. And uh, that is the major improvement over KN, the KNN method, right? Yes, correct. So in fact, you can, you can use this approach actually for other problems, not just multiple instance learning problem. So I've never tried, but uh, I think the main th another takeaway from this example with the citation canon is perhaps it's better to normalize the counts. Like I mentioned earlier, like like for example, like if you are a point that is located in the like high density regions, then you're more likely to have like more points citing you as opposed to if you're far away. So like it's always good to normalize like the counts like this. Yeah, do, yeah. Then, do you have to know is is citation canon still um uh, subject to the same weaknesses as KNN in terms of the dimensionality of the data. Because yes. the way I understand yeah. it is that if there's very high dimensions, then if there's uh, one feature that dominates against all others, then it's potentially problematic, right? Yeah, I think it will it will still be affected in that case. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. But it uh, is on the baseline KNN. Yeah. Of what we see now. Yes. Okay, sure. Yeah, because with this data, uh, I've already reduced the dimension like to something that is much lower. That's why I think it can perform well. But okay. yeah, but of course, like you usually don't use this kind of things. I think with image data, so I use it here because like it's easy because you can visualize it like this. Oh, okay, so so yeah. it works because we already put it into some. We are using summary data for. Uh... Yes. Okay. So sure. I've already sort of compressed this uh, into some low dimensional points that sort of captures like this idea and during like the training of this i've also made sure that like the representation is sort of robust if you rotate the image or if you flip the image that's why it can sort of work in this case okay yeah but yeah this is just for illustration yeah but yeah but anyway like that's sort of it i guess for lab one uh anyone has any other questions Yeah, so if not, then it's 11.37 now. I think we can go for a lunch break. Uh, so I think maybe we should go for one hour lunch break because I think it would take a while for you. I mean, you need to go out to buy food since we can't eat outside. And yeah, so let's let's give it one hour. So maybe we can we can resume the, sec the session at 12.40. Yeah, uh, hmm? yeah, sorry. One other question is that will the recording be shared with us later or? So I'm not too sure on that. So that depends again. I'm I'm thinking I think it will probably be shared, but so but I don't know because like 
I'm not doing like any of the okay, sure, admins sure. I and everything. I yeah. right. But I, but I can I can I can ask to clarify this. I think like it will be useful uh, if if it is shared so you can go through again. Yeah. Okay, sorry to interrupt. And no, no worries. But anyway, yeah, let's go for a lunch break. Then we can reconvene at twelve forty. Yep. So yeah. Meanwhile, like if you have any other questions. Uh, so wait. So there's question from Arunova. So lab when when is the lab three is scheduled? So I can't promise yet. Uh, I think like the rest of the section probably will take us long. Mm. So we will reconvene at twelve forty, and we have lab two after that. Uh, so maybe give it like maybe towards the afternoon, maybe three p.m., four p.m. I can't really sure. Mm. But yeah, uh, so if you have a meeting at 1.30, you can just come back for a lab tree later. Maybe maybe you won't have like lab tree before like 3 p.m. I think, yeah, or 2.30 at, at, at the earliest, yeah. So no worries. And um, meanwhile, if you have any question, like you can just type in on the chat. Uh, then I'll try to answer after after the lunch break. So yeah, so thank you everyone. See you again later. <laughs>